Okay, well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, for me, it's a great honor because normally I'm actually presenting at law schools and not at mathematical departments. Um, and therefore also my talk will be actually largely a use case because I understand blockchain, but I cannot cope myself. So I can also not do protocols. Um, but I hope though that you find it interesting. And if you have any questions during my presentation, I would love to already give you any answers you like. Um, so my presentation is about the modernization of corporate governance, blockchain as a solution. And I put in a question mark because the answer is not yet there. I'm still hesitating. I think blockchain has particular features that can be of use, and I will tell you about it. But also, it should also be a means to an end, and not an end in itself, because it shouldn't be only as used as a marketing tool. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to tell you today is about the following. So I think in this room, everybody already knows what blockchain is. So I'm not going to explain to you as a law or a legal scholar what blockchain is. However, I will introduce you a little bit to my field of research, corporate governance and corporate law. Um, afterwards, I will introduce you the agency theory linked to blockchain. Then we will have a little bit of a discussion on the firms traded on blockchains. And later on, I will focus on the focal point of this presentation, the AGM, and a blockchain-based AGM. And the AGM is the annual general meeting where shareholders can actually exercise their voting rights. And last but not least, food for thought. I have a lot of questions that still need to be answered. And as David already indicated, financial institutions are very rigid institutions. So lots still needs to be cleared out and not still needs to be done. And therefore, there are still many questions. Um, and maybe actually you can provide me some answers. So I'm very curious to any of your thoughts too. OK, so corporate governance. Um, Actually, there is no such thing as a global corporate law or global corporate governance. In the US, actually, corporate governance, corporate law is very much state-based. And also, in any other part of the world, it's very much a national thing. However, previously, there were five uh, characteristics indicated as being the five key features of corporations all over the world. First of all, corporations have legal personality. They can engage in contracting. Shareholders have limited liability, meaning that they are only liable up to their committed amount. So that if Apple, for example, goes bankrupt, you have shares in Apple, you never are going to pay off all the creditors of Apple because you have this limited liability. Then, shares are transferable, meaning that as shareholders change, corporations do not cease to exist. So as a difference to partnerships, corporations will have a perpetual life. And because of these characteristics, limited liability and transferability of shares, we normally have corporations with numerous and changing shareholders. And the fourth characteristic means that in many jurisdictions nowadays, ownership is tied to investors, to shareholders. However, these shareholders, these investors, they have these control rights, decision-making rights, but it would be too costly for them to do it by themselves. They would have a huge inefficiency problem. And therefore, we also see the fifth characteristic, the delegated management. Shareholders delegate part of their powers to a daily decision-making organ, the corporate board, in order to determine, for example, the strategy of the company. So this solves the problem. However, because of the fact that shareholders are that um, numerous and constantly changing, they also have a problem to monitor these board members. And therefore, whereas the delegated management on the one hand solves the problem, it also creates another problem, which you may all known by the agency problem. So the agency problem is a very big thing in corporate law and corporate governance. And most of the studies in corporate governance and also the regulations actually focus on just solving this agency problem because we assume that managers have different incentives from shareholders and therefore act in their own interest and not in the interest of the shareholders. And because shareholders are with that many, actually they cannot do a proper monitoring. So regulation needs to come into place. And this is not new actually. Adam Smith already identified the agency problem in his Wealth of Nations. So we assume that 
managers do not act in the interest of the shareholders or board members do not act in the interest of the shareholders. And corporate governance has been busy for ages, for decades, on solving this question on how to formulate this optimal agency contract. This optimal contract in order to incentivize managers or corporate board members in order to act in the interest of their shareholders. And Jensen and McLean already stated a few decades ago that there will always be a residual loss. So even if you have say on pay, disclosure, everything to, in order to align incentives, you still have some residual loss because you always have two parties involved with diverging incentives. Of course, there are some other agency problems too. We have small and large shareholders and we also have the stakeholders that are involved in corporations. Okay, so what is now the link with blockchain? Because of course we are here at a blockchain conference. Well, the key question is, how can agency costs be fully removed? Is that ever possible? Can agency costs be ever fully removed? I mean, I just indicated that Jensen and Meckling say, well, there will always be a residual loss, but can, is there a way to remove agency costs? Well, the answer is very straightforward. We can use blockchain technology in order just to remove the agents, to have a company that is solely based on shareholders making decisions themselves. So nowadays in corporate law, we have two types of decisions. Shareholders do delegate those decisions that are made on a daily basis, like the strategic decisions of the company. But those decisions that are too um, important to delegate, such as mergers, acquisitions, but also the election of the board members, are kept with the shareholders. With blockchain technology, we can actually make sure that shareholders can make all decisions in an efficient way. And of course, I just told you, I'm not a technical expert, but I would choose the color blue for this blockchain, definitely. So we already saw this happening in the past. The DAO, I think many of you, I'm sure everybody actually remembers this, the first decentralized autonomous organization. And this was the first organization that was not having any hierarchical structure. So there was no board involved. This um, company, founded by Slocket, was a, a venture capitalist fund and was made fully on the blockchain. It used the Ethereum blockchain. However, before any investments actually could take place, this blockchain or this DAO got hacked. And by hacked, it actually means that, of course, the smart contract was uh, beaten by somebody, or in a way, the terms of the smart contract were used in such a way to divert actually $50 million uh, at the time. So, you all know what happened here, and that's as a result, we now have two Ethereums. We have Ethereum Classic, and we have the normal Ethereum, and a hard fork was used. I think this is very interesting from a corporate governance perspective. And why? Well, this is indicated by this quote. You see that because there was somebody, a party, that was able to divert this 50 million year dollars in order by, or actually by using the smart contracts in a smarter way, some people actually wanted to get some human intervention. And they were actually looking for leadership. And here you see that the opinions of Vitalik were interpreted as leadership. And from a corporate governance perspective, this actually, for me, shows some analogy to the normal corporation where you have a corporate board where shareholders delegate the decision-making to. So I would say that the DAO was a very nice example that um, these this, uh, decentral or autonomous organizations do have very nice benefits, but are not a substitute for corporations at this point in time. Um, does this mean that um, blockchain is not useful for corporations or corporate governance in general? Well, obviously not. We've seen many other initiatives before, and some of them were already mentioned today, especially in the case of shared trading on a blockchain. 
we've seen um, Nasdaq already a front runner since 2015, trying to get all kinds of projects uh, with different parties to actually have shares traded on the blockchain, normally focusing on private companies because of the scalability. And we also see T0, um, initiative of overstock.com, to in decrease the duration of the trading and settlement procedures of stock from T plus three, so three business days to T zero days. And then we have this in great initiative in Australia, the chess replacement initiative, where you see that nowadays the stock exchange in Australia is trying to put all shares traded and settled on the blockchain. This is all very um, recent and all very much happening at this moment. So we don't know where it ends. However, in order to have all shares traded on the blockchain, I think we need to wait some years before that happens. However, there are some other nice initiatives that are nowadays already feasible. And this is very much linked to my research and also how actually I arrived at doing something related to blockchain, to corporate voting. Um, Normally, I actually engage in doing research and empirically study shareholder behavior and shareholder voting. And together with my colleague, Christel van der Elst, um, we do a lot of data collection. And we just noticed there was something, or many things were wrong when you looked at the data and things didn't match up. So for example, if you had a voting uh, result statement that didn't add up with the voting um, notification, those kind of things. So in corporate voting, there is a lot of potential for blockchain, um, and that's what I'm going to tell you now. However, before I go into this, first something about the AGM. So the AGM, the Annual General Meeting of Shareholders, is where um, shareholders vote. They make formal decisions in the AGM. That's the only place where they actually can engage in formal decision making according to the law. Therefore, the AGM is very important in corporate law theory. Shareholders can vote, shareholders can ask questions, and shareholders get information. However, in practice, they usually call very dull mandatory rituals. Before, prior to this whole proxy voting procedure, actually shareholders had to come to these meetings physically. And you can imagine, if you are a very small shareholder and your marginal vote is approaching zero, and your cost of voting in order to show up physically is positive, you will not exercise your vote. Then the proxy voting system was implemented, meaning that shareholders then could actually assign a proxy or vote remotely. So the cost lowered and the attendance increased. However, exactly because of this remote voting system, this proxy voting system, the AGM itself became very dull. Why? Almost no shareholder showed up anymore. Everything was done remotely. The voting outcome was already known beforehand. And from a Dutch study, we can conclude that on average, only eight shareholders asked questions during these meetings. So you can say that these rituals, these yearly rituals that are costly to organize, are quite dull mandatory rituals. The corporate management normally already knows beforehand what the outcome of the vote is. So it's just like a puppet show. Then, with respect to the proxy voting system, so that brought a solution to the um, attendance rates of shareholders and the um, participation rates. However, it also brought some very complicated system and many mistakes. And the Vice Chancellor Lester in Delaware formulates this very nicely in his speech. And he asks institutional investors to solve these problems with proxy voting and become the plumbers of the proxy voting system. So in order to see what is going wrong with this proxy voting system at the moment, we need to see what actually is this proxy voting system. So I already told you that the settlement and clearing of the transactions on the stock exchanges normally take three business days. This is because there are many intermediaries involved. So if you are a shareholder, you do not buy shares directly from a company. No, 
in the US case, you go to your broker, or as an institutional investor, you go to your custodian, and you actually buy via this intermediary shares. What do you get? Well, you actually get a book entry on their accounts. And those intermediaries, either the custodian or the broker, hold then um, accounts by the CSD, the Central Securities Depository. And the Central Securities Depository in the US is the DTC with its nominee, CD and Co. So this CSD doesn't hold all the shares. Actually, also this CSD makes use of a book entry system, which is linked to the share immobilization characteristic. Because in the years uh, around the 1970s, the trade volume became so big that actually it wasn't be feasible anymore to do it all with the paperwork. And therefore, they created this accounting system to do all the shares um, keeping only as a book entry. So if shares are traded, there is only an adjustment in the books of the DTC and nothing happens with the paper. So if you hold a share, you do not hold any paper certificate anymore. So as an investor, you hold an account with your intermediary and that intermediary then again holds an account with a CSD in the US, the DTC. And then you also have all kinds of other parties involved, including Broadridge, who is normally doing the proxy voting process, and ISS, who is taking care of voting recommendations. So you have all these intermediaries involved. And if you then think about shareholder voting, but also the information going from companies to shareholders, you see that these votes and this information actually has to pass many intermediaries before it reaches from company to shareholder or shareholder to company. And this is just on the sheet a very easy example because if you have um, a situation of cross-border voting, it is actually much, much difficult, much more difficult. Um, you often also have the international CSDs, so there are many intermediaries involved. And you can imagine that these this system leads to many mistakes. Um, a nice example is actually a US example, um, and it involves an appraisal rights case. And I'm not sure whether you all are familiar with Delaware law, but if there is a merger, you can, as a shareholder, um, go to court and ask a fair price for your shares. So here, actually, a few years ago, Dell, Michael Dell, wanted to take Dell private and um, provided a price for the sh existing shareholders to buy their shares. Well, some minority shareholders actually didn't agree with this price and asked the court for a fair price. However, the Delaware law actually um, um, requires that shareholders needed to vote um, not yes, so they can either vote no or withhold their votes in this vote to have this merger, in this case, the demerger of Dell. So what happened? T. Rowe Price voted, at least they thought, voted no, because they were against this uh, merger and they wanted to, in an appraisal procedure, ask for a fair price. Something went wrong in this whole chain of intermediaries and the vote was turned from a no vote into a yes vote. Meaning that in this appraisal procedure, T. Rowe Price, as an asset manager for many other investors, ultimate beneficial owners, actually wasn't able to take part and in the end didn't get the fair price that was much higher than the initial price that they got in the merger of Dell. So here you see that actually lots can happen in this chain of intermediaries. Somewhere there is a mistake, information is not passed through correctly, and it has big financial um, consequences. So Euro Price, by the way, um, compensated all its ultimate beneficial owners for the price difference, um, but there was for them, as a private party, was not much to do because this was just a, well, a mistake in the system. And much more happens, actually. 
So this was the case where a vote was not passed through correctly. Well, sometimes actually also votes are not counted correctly. And last um, year, in a proxy fight with Michael Peltz, um, he actually uh, wanted to get a board seat uh, with the company Procter & Gamble, and he engaged in a very expensive proxy fight. After the calculations of the votes, it turned out that he lost with a margin of 0.2%, which was very bad for this Michael Peltz. Why? Because he actually wanted to get on the board, and it's very expensive to get on the board. And therefore, he, in the end, asked for a recount, because he felt that with such a small margin, maybe this should have made a mistake. And in the end, it turned out that there was a mistake made, and he won even with a uh, smaller margin. So nowadays, um, Pels is part of the Procter & Gamble boards. But it can be even worse. Uh, a few years ago, actually 2008, you had this case with Yahoo, um, where there was a director election, and in the end, it turned out that one of the directors was not elected with 85% of the votes, but actually 66. Um, one of the bigger investors complained after the voting results were published because this investor had a very high stake and it didn't match with the voting results. And what happened? It turned out that Broadridge simply missed 1 million shares. So it just missed 1 million votes to count in the voting results. You, these are some of the cases that are known. There are many other cases, but there are also many cases that are not known because it's usually impossible to actually count or see whether there is some mistake in the voting results. However, in Europe, there's actually the same story. And this is also how I came to this research topic, because sometimes the results just don't match. And you see that in Europe nowadays, there is this new shareholder rights directive that was implemented last year and needs to be implemented in the, ne in the member states um, all this summer. And also here you see that nowadays in Europe they are taking steps to increase and improve the shelter voting and shareholder engagement system. So also here the European Commission actually indicates that shareholder information and shareholder votes are not always transmitted correctly from company to shareholders and shareholders to companies in this whole intermediate uh, intermediation chain. So also in Europe, there are some problems and some parties seem to think that blockchain can serve as a solution to these problems. So in the implementing regulation of this shareholder rights directive, this revised shareholder rights directive, Europe actually indicates that the use of modern technologies in communication between issuers, the companies and their shareholders and any intermediaries can actually improve this shareholder voting shareholder engagement system. And Lester, as the Vice Chancellor of the Delaware Court, also indicates that distributed ledger technologies can provide better accuracy, greater transparency, and superior efficiency for settling securities, trades, and voting in corporate elections. So there is a potential of blockchain, apparently, at least according to these parties. And if you think about it, Blockchain can indeed offer a solution. It's, if shareholder voting takes place on a blockchain, you can say that shareholders are voting with their voting rights on the blockchain and smart contracts can govern their ac um, access rights. So for instance, you can include the charter, corporate charter or the articles of association in the blockchain and you can give shareholders that have a particular threshold of shares, for example, particular rights, particular actions, such as adding a proposal to the AGM agenda. There are different rules in different countries how to put a proposal, a shareholder proposal on the agenda. And you can actually implement this with a smart contract. With proxy voting, shareholders on the blockchain, shareholders actually can get end-to-end -end confirmation, meaning that shareholders can actually see whether or not their votes are included in the voting results. 
And especially for institutional investors nowadays, this is important because nowadays they also need to disclose their voting policy and they also need to be able to participate in the vote and see whether or not, or show to the larger public whether or not they actually um, have this vote according to their voting policy. So this can also be, for them, a useful case to actually show the greater public that they vote according to their voting policy. At this moment, however, in order to have this proxy voting blockchain, we still need to have a permission blockchain. Why? Shares are not traded on the blockchain yet. It will also not happen for all shares in the near future. And therefore, we need to have a party that actually um, grants permission to shareholders with the right rights to actually um, be able to vote on the blockchain. So we need to have an intermediary, a permissioner. And you see nowadays that all the parties that are involved in these blockchain initiatives are actually intermediaries themselves. So it's kind of a red race to who is going to be the first in this whole technology um, race in order to be the permissioner. My question here is that we still have other solutions too. This morning was already mentioned Git as one of the other solutions. And for this purpose, it's not completely sure whether we actually need a blockchain. Why? With Git, we can also have a decentralized um, ledger that uses Merkle trees. Do we really need the distributed uh, characteristics of blockchain? We probably need smart contracts to also implement these um, access rights and um, also, for example, the provisions in the Articles of Association to tailor it to the company. But as I said, it's a means to an end. If Git turns out to be good as well, why not use Git? It seems, however, that practice says that blockchain is the best solution, at least at this point in time. You see that with many initiatives. And one of the initiatives was launched around two years ago, um, a working group of CSDs. You see one of the intermediaries that actually launched a protocol or um, a process flow of how a shareholder meeting should be organized. And they initiated or identified several steps in order for a blockchain shareholder meeting to take place. So you have the meeting initialization and notification on the blockchain. Then all the other intermediaries load their ownership records on the blockchain. From this ownership records, um, voting rights are allocated to the shareholders, the ultimate beneficial owners that actually do need to vote. And also particular access rights are granted, such as uh, for those that have the uh, proper threshold in order to put a shareholder proposal on the agenda. Then there is some kind of voting party authentication. And this is where you, for example, need to upload your passport. Uh, and I know there are some um, nice applications on blockchain about this identity um, um, uh, issue. Also, for example, in Estonia, you can see that you use the e-residency uh, program for this, but there needs to be some identification uh, of shareholders that they state uh, that they are who they say they are. Then you have the proxy assignment, because sometimes shareholders actually do want to assign a, a proxy or appoint a proxy, and then the voting takes place. And this is a very interesting feature, because nowadays we still have this annual general meeting where you can vote until a particular deadline, and then the meeting takes place. Well, with this kind of blockchain technology, we can also think about a meeting that doesn't take place annually, but maybe more often. Maybe we have a continuous shareholder voting system where whenever a company actually has a decision to be made by shareholders, they can initiate a blockchain AGM without the annual characteristic. That's one of the food for thoughts. Then we have the meeting management, meaning that shareholders actually should be able to see the voting results as from the cutoff date when the voting is done. And then we also have some post-meeting actions, meaning that um, there needs to be some regulatory requirements that can be, uh, need to be made, uh, meet, for example, um, um, if the voting results need to be published on the corporate website.
I think the battery is running low and I cannot change the of the computer. Yes? Is it still working now? Okay. Okay, so the CSD uh, initiative was one of the first initiatives and lately Broadridge actually was the one that filed a patent for this whole shared proxy voting system. Um, Broadridge is one of the parties that can be the permissioner, that can actually take care of this um, access granting of shareholders that want to vote on the blockchain. The difficult part, however, here is that Broadridge actually owns 80% or has 80% of the market in proxy voting in the US, meaning that if we have blockchain as the party that is involved here, um, it will be also a monopolized market with the permission blockchain. Lots of things also, again, to consider. And there are many more other initiatives regarding shareholder voting and blockchain technology. We have uh, all over the world different initiatives. Uh, for example, Banco Santander is actually working together with Broadridge, and they stated that in um, last year, the AGM was actually already on the blockchain. Um, and so actually also did the Dutch company, Casbank. And Casbank, um, we work together actually with uh, these people. Uh, it's a custodian, so again, an intermediary. And they had a pilot with uh, proxy voting on the blockchain, but then additional to their normal proxy voting and their normal AGM. And you can see that they had a very simple interface using uh, or used for their um, blockchain proxy voting system. So here you see in Dutch the uh, agenda uh, point eight. So you see um, uh, whether you are um, in favor, against, or you want to withhold your votes. And they also wanted to have some kind of tool where you can also, as a shareholder, give feedback to the company. So you can also indicate why you vote in favor, against, or withhold your votes. This was a very simple tool, and they actually, they afterwards announced that it's was a success, but I have to admit that this was a success because only a few shareholders took place in this pilot, and it was also run um, in addition to their normal proxy voting system and their normal AGM. So these votes were not votes in law. They were not legally valid votes. And therefore, this project was a success, but we do not know how this will um, be going if actually it actually replaces the proxy voting or um, it has actually votes that are lawfully casted. Again, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, for example, if you want to have um, an uh, AGM on a blockchain, do you then also want to include shareholder questions in this blockchain? Do you want to make this, and I have to go one sheet further, one fully virtual AGM where shareholders can ask their questions. Do you want to put these questions on the blockchain or not? Do you want to get rid of the completely physical AGM? Um, or is this still too far-fetched in the future? There is a lot of resistance nowadays to fully, uh, fully virtual AGMs. For example, institutional investors are very much against this type of AGM still at this moment because they want to have a physical place where they meet the board members. They are also afraid that questions will be overlooked or cherry-picked, that they cannot hold board members accountable anymore because they will not respond to very uh, difficult questions. Intel is a company that already has fully virtual meetings. Um, so there is a tendency every year that fully virtual meetings um, are taking place more and more. A few years back, there were almost zero. Now there are actually quite a lot, over 100 in the US. Um, so do we want to go to a fully virtual platform where we also include, for example, shareholder questions in the blockchain? Then they get immutable, everybody can see the questions and board members perhaps cannot ignore them anymore. Or is this also not feasible at this moment in time? As I told you before, would we get rid of the annual characteristic of the AGM? meaning that you can actually have shareholder votes more often when a company actually needs a decision to be made by shareholders? Or do you 
want to keep this annual characteristic. At this point in time, in many jurisdictions, it's not possible to remove this annual characteristic because the meeting has to take place yearly to adopt the financial statements. However, the financial statements adoption is just a legal formality. If you take this one step further, actually, you can say that the blockchain technology allows us at least to think about the div uh, division between the powers, the division of powers between shareholders and board members. For example, do we want shareholders to make more decisions? Or maybe, do we also want to uh, give some decision rights to other stakeholders? With blockchain technology, where you can actually provide voting rights to different parties, you can have such a thing as a fluid democracy. I'm not saying that it's desirable. It really also depends on the jurisdiction. You see a large movement in Europe towards the stakeholder model. Even the UK is moving in the stakeholder direction. It's just food for thought. But the blockchain technology makes us able to rethink our corporate governance model. And then I get back to the question that I asked before. Who will, at this state, be the permissioner? Because we need a party that, because we're talking about private blockchain, a permission blockchain, we need a party that is the gatekeeper. Will it be, like in Australia, the stock exchange? Will it be um, the um, CSD? Will it be Broadridge? We have different parties um, that we can think of, and I think because every party, you see that every of these intermediaries is nowadays also busy with developing technology, um, blockchain technology in this area, we will see whoever comes out of, as the winner of this red race. I think that's about it as the update for corporate governance um, and blockchain shareholder voting. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, no, the cost of, of, at this moment, the virtual AGM is quite high compared to the physical AGM because they have to invest in all these technology. Um, so I, there is no such thing as a comparison yet for the blockchain AGM. I think it also depends on what kind of technology you use. Um, but no, there is not such a comparison yet. And I think actually the investment costs for companies at this moment um, are too big in order to change their models, especially because they have this, um, usually the AGM is held um, together with a law firm, with a notary, and they usually have these budgets already for their AGM. They have already this as a cost on their, in their, in their accounts. And the thing is that the business model for having this AGM uh, for the companies is not that big of an advantage. So what we need to do is we need to actually get um, institutional investors involved, they can have a huge benefits of having these proxy votes in uh, a more um, transparent way, in an immutable way to also have this end-to-end -end confirmation. And if they ask this technology as the standard in the industry for companies, then I think we would have a switch. But for companies, there will not be that much of a cost advantage to organize an AGM on the blockchain. And that's also why you see that nowadays companies themselves are not very much into organizing these blockchain AGMs. However, the industry itself, they are the ones, so the financial industry uh, are the ones busy with these initiatives. So I would say that institutional investors are, in the end are the ones that need to ask for this technology.
Uh -huh. That's actually a very nice question. So you're actually questioning whether sh some shareholders should be having voting rights at all. They don't really care. They don't participate, and, and that's correct. But that's, that's a more of a fundamental question in corporate law. What should be the division between shareholder and, and board members in decision making? And I would say that if you have this blockchain technology, you can at least assign particular rights to particular shareholders. Um, you can rethink what should be decided by boards, what should be decided by shareholders. Maybe other stakeholders should be involved. But I think this is not a question that blockchain can solve. It just can so, um, serve as a tool to solve, um, to, to, to help you get the, the underlying answer. So as soon as we know the answer, it should be actually, I would say it's the governance model should be tailor-made for every company. So um, some companies would actually have more of a stakeholder model. Uh, maybe companies that have more consumers involved, they want to have some decision-making rights for consumers or at least some feedback from consumers. And I would say that blockchain technology enables you to have this tailor-made corporate governance model and also make you rethink the current corporate governance model. I definitely agree with you that shareholders do not always know what's best for the company. And many shareholders, private investors, are not engaged with corporate voting. On the other hand, you have these institutional investors. And if they cast their vote, they should be able to know that their vote is counted in the voting results. And I would say that, therefore, blockchain can actually um, lead to a completely different way of thinking about corporate governance. But as a tool, we should define how we in the end, want to have this corporate governance. So yes, you're definitely right. <laughs>